Do you want to hear about that one time I bought a new sports car? Even though everyone says cars are the worst financial decisions in the world. Yeah, you do. Keep listening to learn all about it. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to episode number 87 of the Physician Philosopher Podcast, where we take an uncurated and unapologetic look into physician life, money, and mindset. So this is obviously a money episode. I started with talking about cars. So today's thought is this. Spending money to find happiness in life is part science, part art, and 100% individual to the person. All right, Alicia, what's up? How are you doing? I am well. You know, it's the weekend when we're recording this, and so I'm very excited about getting an actual Saturday off. So I'm feeling great. What about you? <laughs> I'm good. I remember having Saturdays off during residency. That was a big deal. Yes, yes. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> yeah, I, so I think I think both of us are going to be spending the day the same way. We're both going to the pool after this, after we record this episode. Yes, yes. So today we're going to be talking about you know, spending money. And, and I really, you know, I really love, this is by far and away my favorite topic in all of personal finance, you know, which is behavioral finance, psychology of money, if you will. And, uh, and we're going to talk about that today. And I think this is really a fun topic to talk about because everybody loves talking about the, the, the numbers and, you know, the math with money because it's easy to measure, but it's easily, you know, the lesser, you know, or the least important part of money, if you will, like the psychology part is so much bigger. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about ways that science has actually shown that we can be happy with money. But we're also going to talk about some ways that you and I like to splurge on money as personal finance and the self-proclaimed money nerds, how you and I like to do that. And so I you know, thought this topic would be great because I actually just recently bought a car, um, you know, despite all the science saying that cars are terrible financial decisions, I bought one. And so we're going to talk about at the end of the show why I decided to do that. But before we get there, let's talk about what the social sciences, the psychology of money says about how we can spend money or use money. And it's not always spending to find happiness. And it's funny because I'm a huge Ben Rector fan. I'm actually going to go uh, to a Ben Rector concert with my entire family, my wife, my three kids this coming Friday. And uh, he's got a new, uh, a new song out called Sunday, which it features Snoop Dogg in it. Uh, and <laughs> in that song, uh, it talks about how he wants to spend Sunday. He wants to, you know, take that time and waste it. And my son's like, Dad, why doesn't why doesn't Ben Rector say spend the time instead of wasting the time? And I was like, you know, that's a really good question. He's eight. Was, you know, so as as you're thinking about this, we're talking about spending money, not wasting money, uh, and how you might use it. And so the most quintessential way that people always start this conversation, Alicia, is about experiences over things that you need to spend money on experiences over things. And so that's what the science says. Do you, do you agree with that? Or like, what's your experience when it comes to this stuff? You know what? I think a part of it is true, right? The, the science behind it, or I guess the thought behind it is that when you purchase an experience, then you get three quote unquote sources of happiness, right? You get this happiness in anticipation of the experience happening. And so from the time you book the flight to the time that you take the flight for whatever trip, you're really excited about that. And that gives you a source of happiness. And then when you're on the trip itself, that gives you another source of happiness because you're actually enjoying the experience. And then once the experience is over, once the trip has happened, then you get this third source of happiness from all the memories and all of the you know times that you've had having the experience. And so you get three sources of happiness, right? One before the trip, one during the trip, and one after the trip. And I think that's why people think, okay, if you were to purchase an experience, you get these three sources of happiness. Um, and I think a part of that is right, but as you're probably alluding to, it's not everything, right? You shouldn't purchase an experience over something else that you really, really want. In your case, I know you love cars, right? And so maybe purchasing an experience that you don't care about isn't as valuable to you as you purchasing a car that you really love. Uh, so I think it's nuanced. I think it's different for each person, but it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I think for most car people, right? And and I said I was going to talk about this in the show, but I'm going to talk about it now because you brought it up. So. <laughs> So for, I think for most car people, like my, my Porsche is, is an experience. I love that thing. Right. And like, I did lots of research before I decided to buy that specific car, that you know, specific make and model. And like, I grew up with cars, like being in part of my DNA. Like the first car that I ever drove was a, you know, 1986, you know, 1985, excuse me, Ford Mustang. And it was a four cylinder that my dad and I converted to a V8. Like we took everything apart. I mean, it, it, like some of it was a complete total piece of junk. Uh, you know, we had four speakers, two of them were subwoofers because I'm that kind of guy. Uh, so I could make the, the trunk <laughs> rattle, but uh, the music quality was was subpar. My dad was not, you know, a huge electrical guy, uh, but man, he could tear apart a car in terms of the, you know, the engine, the transmission, all that stuff, put it back together 
Uh, and so I grew up with that, like as being part of my family experience. And my dad to this day still works on cars. So he, he's been working on a Corvair for like, I don't even know, like 10 years now. And, and so for me, like the, the lead up to buying the car was an experience. Driving the car is an experience. Sharing that with my, with my three kids. Uh, yes, I'm a terrible human being that put his three kids inside <laughs> of a two-seater Porsche Boxster. Um, but I drove very slow. They all enjoyed it uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, for me, like it, it is a thing, but it's also an experience. And, and I think for most people, the reason why it's such a terrible financial decision is because cars are probably not a part of their DNA the same way that, you know, that they might be for people that are really, truly car enthusiasts. And, and, and to be absolutely clear about this, I also didn't do this until like, you know, we had paid off our student loans and we didn't have any other car loans. And, you know, like we, you know, really took the time. I mean, I'm, I'm, seven, eight years outside of training now. And I finally bought the car that I wanted to buy for, you know, for a long time. And that car has changed just for the record. But yeah, I think that those three things you talk about, right. The anticipation, the experience during, and then the, the memory of those events is so important. And that's the reason why psychology and the behavioral sciences really do support spending your money on experiences, vacations, trips, you know, over things. That said, I do know that people can take this the the opposite direction, be huge about experience. I got friends that are like, like they only fly first class. They, you know, make, make an experience out of everything. Right. And, and they do it to the, to the nines. And it like, for me, I look at that and I'm like, man, that seems like a total waste of money, you know? And so like, I, I think it's funny that it can, it can kind of go both ways. Like you can't, you can't spend so extravagantly on experiences that it actually probably is way more than you need to actually accomplish that goal of really enjoying it, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. And it, you know, it makes me curious um, because you talk about your Porsche the same way a lot of people talk about their Tesla um, and that they love their Tesla. It's an experience. It's the best of the best. It's safety. It's a whole experience. And um, I'm just curious to get your thoughts. Do you think that a doctor has to be financially independent or have a certain level of net worth before they are able to or before they should purchase one of these uh, cars or have one of these financial splurges? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so for me, when I'm talking to my, you know, my students, what I always talk to them about is, is, is starting with the end in mind, right? So, so for me, when I got to this point of making the decision about buying the car, I was like, okay, well, it's a $70,000 car, right? It's a, it's a seven year old car. That's $70,000. Uh, the MSRP on this thing was 89 grand, $90,000 when it was sold in 2015 and it's held its value because of everything's going electric these cars that are naturally aspirated cars that are tons of fun to drive. And like, by the way, sound 9,000 times better than an electric car that just makes this like, "Mm," like, I I don't want, I don't want that as a driving (laughs) experience personally, but all that to say, like, you know, it it is a decision to be made. And for me, when I kept the end in mind, I was like, I'm going to be financially independent outside of my business. Right. So like, let's just ignore the cash flow that, that, you know, comes through the entrepreneurial efforts that I put into the last six years, five years outside of that, just like, saving inside of a 403b 457 hsa with boring low cost diversified index funds my family's gonna be financially independent before the age of 50. and when i thought about that i was like you know i, I keep delaying this purchase because I'm, I'm so concerned about what other people think and i'm a personal finance money nerd i teach people about money and so there was like some of that judgment and guilt going on there but when i realized like i could buy this car and still be financially independent before the age of 50. like what am i doing right like why why not buy the car And, um, and so that for me was, was how I went through the process of thinking through it It was like, can I accomplish my financial goals of being financially independent before the age of 50 and still purchase this car? And the answer was yes. And so I did. Right. Whereas some people will say like, no, like, you know, you're, you know, your net worth's negative $400,000. You can't buy a car. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I talk to my students about that. Like if you think it's inappropriate for someone panhandling on the street to buy it, you know, a Tesla, a hundred thousand dollar Tesla then it's probably inappropriate for you to consider buying one when you're $500,000 negative in net worth. And you know you, you haven't even figured out whether your annual savings goals are going to let you retire by the age of 65. Like If you haven't done the work to figure out like if you're accomplishing your financial goals or not, I would say it's absolutely inappropriate to, to buy anything extravagant or you know, out, of, out of the realm of necessity. But if you've done the work and you figured out like, no, I want to be financially independent by 60. And if I buy this car, like, that's not going to delay that. Buy the car, right? Be happy. You only get one life to live. You might as well be happy while you're living it. 
<laughs> no, that sounds good. That sounds good. So I think what I'm hearing is that you have to have a plan first. And as long as you have that plan in place and you're working on accomplishing it, then there's no problem with splurging along the way within reason, it seems. Within reason. I think that's a good qualifier. So speaking about being reasonable, the second thing that you know really is talked about when it comes to behavioral finance is spending money on others. So specifically, I mean charitable giving. I mean you know, giving to, to organizations or, you know, people that you believe in, that you want to support. And it's really interesting because like, you know, this, right? Like, I mean, there's even like idioms in the, in the English language about how, you know, it's better to give than to receive. Um, and, and that all comes from this idea that spending money on other people and things that you believe in provides both the person receiving it happiness and fulfillment. And it also provides the person that's giving it fulfillment. Uh, and so this is something, this is probably the only piece of this stuff that I got right from the very beginning. Cause Chris and I have, you know, always tithed, you know, we're both Christian. And so out of a, a religious, uh, belief and tradition, we, we've always given money to, to the church and to other people. Um, but it, at the same time, like this is something that some people kind of have a hard time doing. And, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting, like where people fall on that spectrum. I don't think there's right or wrong here for, for, you know, me when I'm talking to people about this, but I do think it's important to realize the social sciences, behavioral science says that if you actually spend money on other people, it's going to make you happy. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think um, I am similar to you and Kristen in that I also tithe and it's also been a value of mine since, since I've had, I mean, I've had for a long time. Um, and so I also give, but I've heard this other side as well from people who maybe didn't grow up in a Christian home like you and I, who kind of feel like, hey, how I why should I give money to other people when I'm $500,000 in debt? Shouldn't I put my own oxygen mask on first? Shouldn't I worry about myself first? And so it's really interesting to kind of hear those conflicting viewpoints. And I really don't think that one is right and one is wrong. It really just depends on your own value system. Um, I know it was really interesting. I was on social media the other day and I was looking at a post that was talking about a family savings account, which I thought was genius. But the crux of it was there are a lot of people who grew up in cultures in which taking care of their extended family is expected and is something that they value very dearly, kind of like you and I value tithing very, very, mm -hmm. very dearly. And we were kind of, and, and the article was talking about how can you do this in a way that's not detrimental for yourself? How can you do this when you're still, you know, paying off your own student loans or when you still got a mortgage that you need to pay off? And the idea was, to build it into your budget and create this this entirely separate account called your family savings account where you put money in there each month that your family can use as they need it or you know as things arise and i think it's very similar in that you know we spend money on others through tithing they spend money on others through you know giving money to their extended family and it all boils down to this is something that we value this is something that the social science says will bring us happiness and them happiness um and so i totally agree with the second point of spending money on others yeah and and that's really i think that's a really important conversation to have because there there are cultural differences and many when it comes to money. This is one of the reasons why money is such a taboo topic to talk about is because we all bring our own experiences and traditions and cultures into this conversation. And so, yeah, it's, it's, um, this, that comes up a ton. Um, it comes up not only for, you know, extended family in terms of, you know, people that you're trying to help. It comes up in terms of certain cultures taking care of their parents. It comes up in terms of certain cultures, whether you pay for your kid's college education or not. Right. And mm -hmm. so like all of those things are spending slash saving money for other people. The crux of it for me always comes down to, are you giving to other people and can you still take care of your own needs? Because I will say it's, it's, it's not uncommon to have a conversation with somebody who is saving for the kid's college education, but they're not saving enough to retire by the age of 65 or, you know, whatever age they want, or to hear someone taking care of extended family. And then they have to, they have to keep working into their 60s, 70s, 80s because they are providing that help. And whether that's right or you know wrong for you is going to be dependent upon all of those things we just mentioned, your background, your cultures, your traditions, your religious views. And so it gets it gets really personal very quickly on that. But the science does say that, you know, giving the money to other people is uh, you know, a great way to find happiness. And here's one that I'm not good at. So tr <laughs> tr truth and truth and transparency. I am the opposite of what the social scientists say here. So they say buy small and more often, right? So that's not what I do. I do not buy very often. <laughs> But when I spend money, I spend a lot of money, right? I buy a $70,000 car. And so, uh, so that's, uh, you know, I would argue that my, that my wife, Kristen, she is, she lives this, this, this one to a, to a T like she doesn't buy very expensive things, but she buys stuff frequently. 
And, and I think that what this is getting at, right, is this idea that, you know, you get a hit of dopamine when you buy stuff. This is why some people get kind of that addiction to, to purchases. And, uh, and so if you're going to do that, why not at least buy less expensive things more often and have the same kind of experience of enjoyment or fulfillment without breaking the bank? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I hear you on this. You know, it's interesting because I think um, that this is one of those points where it's the difference between being a resident like myself versus being an attending like yourself, right? I, I can't buy a $70,000. I don't even make $70,000 as my residency salary. So clearly, <laughs> we live very two very different lives. Um, <laughs> for, for now. Um, <laughs> right, right, right. But um, I think this is one of those things where maybe someone in my position who is a resident or a fellow or a newer attending can kind of find some joy and happiness is that, okay, maybe we can't yet afford that big splurge, but the social science says that if we're able to just reward ourselves little by little, maybe it will give us enough happiness along the way. And so maybe it's something like, you know, going to a fancy restaurant once a month where we get to reward ourselves or splurge in that sort of way. Or, you know, maybe it's, you know, if you're someone who likes to go shopping, maybe you buy a new pair of shoes or a new dress or something once a month, or every time you get a paycheck where you're able to get that little bit of joy and happiness um, along the way. And so that might change for me as I become an attending, you know, who knows? It, for me, it's not cars, for me, it's houses. So <laughs> huh. it, used to, it used to be a house for me too. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting because, you know, as you go, it changes and like, it, and it turns out that, you know, you can know a lot about money and this is the reason we're talking about the show, but you're still human. Right. And so like, it's not like once you understand all this stuff, you don't make mistakes. Right. Like I, I've, I've made many, many mistakes and I'm a highly impulsive human being. And so, you know, I, I know I've talked about that before on the show, but like just buying stuff and then using it one time and being like, why did I even spend a hundred dollars on that one thing? And, um, like, you know, the, the leaf blower that I bought and like, I don't, I don't even do my yard anymore. Um, and so, but like when we got the house, it was in the fall and like, I had a bunch of leaves and I didn't have anybody to do my yard yet. And so I, uh, I bought a leaf blower that I used one time and paid a hundred dollars for it. it was the dumbest price sitting in my garage right now as we speak. <laughs> So, you know, by buying smaller, less often, speaking of which, that kind of that kind of bleeds into this this next idea, which is delaying purchases. So if, if you talk like if you think about Alicia, like the idea that you had earlier, right? So of like experiences and why those provide happiness. So if you know that once the calendar, you know, you know that in six months from now, you're gonna be taking that one trip you're really looking forward to for the next six months while you're at work and things are hard and you're in residency or you're an attending physician and you're, you know, you're slogging through work, you've got that one thing to look forward to for six months. Like that, that kind of is that light at the end of the tunnel that you get to look forward to. Right. And so it turns out that if you delay your purchase, it gives you longer to do the research, longer to do the, you know, the consumer reviews, longer to, you know, determine if that's the right trip for you. And you spend more time thinking about this idea that is off in the distance and the anticipation that often comes with that. Uh, and so delaying your purchases, particularly big purchases or trips, is, is one way to actually allow yourself to, to have some happiness. So if, so if it's not expensive, you know, buying small and more often can, can be one way to do it. If it is expensive, delaying the purchase and, and basically delaying that process until it's that moment arrives is actually another way that, that the science has really shown, you know, can help you decrease consumer regret and increase your happiness. Yeah, I totally agree with this one. I think, you know, again, as a, as a resident going into fellowship, you know, my friends and I are already like planning like, oh, what's going to be our big trip this year? Are we going to go to Greece? We're going to go to Belize, you know, um, and I, it's already a source of happiness for us. And so I, I totally agree with this. And I think it's a way that maybe us as trainees can kind of get up to your level in terms of this big financial splurge, just like planning for it ahead of time. So I really do like this one a lot, especially in terms of trips. Um, and I think the social science also says that when you delay the purchase, you make sure that you are actually purchasing something that you yourself find valuable. Mm -hmm. I think the science is that oftentimes we make a lot of impulse buys and then we tend to regret them. And so this almost prevents you from overspending because instead of just buying something on Amazon or buying something because you saw it and you think it'd be cool, delaying the purchase and giving you giving yourself a little bit of extra time to think about whether or not you truly want it, whether or not it's really going to give you the value for it helps you out as well. And so, yeah, I like this one. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, for people like me that are, are impulsive, you know, some, sometimes a way to deal with this is to give yourself a rule to say like, you know, if it costs more than X number of dollars, um, I can't purchase it until I've thought about it for 30 days. 
right? And it's so like just to make yourself have to wait to pull the trigger on something so you don't buy the hundred dollar leaf blower for for no reason. <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I think there are ways to deal with this if you're you know highly uh, impulsive and ADHD like I am. But um, okay, so we talked about experiences over things, spending money on other people, buying smaller and more often, and then delaying you know big purchases. But Alicia, we're also human, and so I think it's worthwhile to spend some time talking about. Okay, you can't always be perfect, right? So, what do you love splurging on financially when you're like, you know what? Like, I know this doesn't make financial sense, but I'm going to do it anyway. And this is this is this is just something that I enjoy so much that I'm willing to 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 splurge. What what, what are those things for you? Yeah, so I kind of alluded to this earlier. I love experiences and I love to travel. Um, and so. I went on this ski trip to Denver, which if you've not been to Denver is one of probably the most expensive places in the country to go skiing. <laughs> um, so I did a ski trip to Denver. Um, I went to Jamaica for my 30th birthday when I turned 30. I, oh my gosh, what other trips have I done? I've got, I mean, I've traveled to so many different places. I'm trying to think the pandemic has kind of put a damper. <laughs> Yeah. And some of those plans. But it's interesting that you bring that up because my father actually really believes in this principle. So fun fact about me. Uh, so my father is very frugal man. Um, he makes a decent amount of money, but he doesn't like to spend it, which was uh, very annoying for me and my two <laughs> brothers growing up. <laughs> I bet. So he like he like refused to buy like really nice cars. We stayed in we, we lived in a very modest home. He just did not like to spend a lot of money. But one of his um, spend points or one of the times where he would spend money was when we were going to go on vacation. And so when I graduated from Duke for undergrad, he took all of us on a European vacation. And so we went to oh. Paris and London and Switzerland and like three cities in Italy. And it was like amazing. And so my dad really does live out this principle. It's like, he's not going to spend money on anything um, <laughs> except like a really big trip that he's going to do, you know, like once every few years. And so I really loved that. You know, it was an amazing trip and my family and I still talk about it to this day. We're planning another one to Australia and South Africa. So it's going to be fun. But this principle of experiences and trips is something that my family and I really hold dear. And then besides that, I really like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. if you're not watching this on the, on the, on the video, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm fairly slim, but um, that is all thanks to God and genetics. Um, <laughs> I love, I love to eat a lot. And so one of my other spending points is like going to a really fancy restaurant, nice steakhouse, like, Oh, love it. I love wine. So I do the whole thing, you know, the fancy wine, the nice steak, like I love that part. And uh, so those are a few of my splurges. I'm curious to hear about yours. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I, uh, I do like food, but that's not really typically. <laughs> well, you know, actually, it's kind of become one of the things for me because um, last Christmas, we wanted to have our family over. And so traditionally, we've kind of gone down to Kristen's parents uh, for Christmas. And um, this time, her brother and his wife were coming and so it's going to be like my family of five the two of them from california kristen's aunt and uncle from you know the border of georgia south carolina and then kristen's parents and they have like a three bedroom two bath house for like you what is that like 12 people 13 people whatever that was going to be <laughs> and um and so i was like so why don't you come to my house like our house up here in north carolina it's a little bit bigger we can actually fit everybody um, you know people can have a little more space when they want their you know want their time because we all know how family family ordeals get sometimes and, um, and so I, I ended up, not I, Kristen, I don't, I'm not taking any credit for this. Kristen was able to talk to her parents and her parents were okay with coming. And, um, and so everybody came to us, but the, it put a big wrench in the plants because our, the one thing that my father-in-law loves doing is smoking meat. And actually hilariously, I just did an episode about, uh, doctors who smoke and it was about, you know, smoking meat with uh, Bradley block on his podcast, <laughs> um, who I know is a, a mutual, uh, friend of ours. But so, so I was talking to Bradley about this, but, um, her, her dad, my father-in-law was like, well, but how are we going to like, you know, cook the roast beast? <laughs> like, the, and, uh, it's so, which is what he calls it. And so, uh, you know, we've got this, this, this problem. It's a family tradition. So I bought a smoker just so that he could like, you know, cook this, this awesome cut of meat for, uh, for, you know, the Christmas, uh, meal. And, um, and so since then, like for the last what, six months, I've learned how to smoke, uh, you know, on the smoker. And so like, I, it, it, that has actually been a, a little bit of a spend for me because it turns out that brisket and, you know, other stuff like that is expensive. Um, but it's been a really good, <laughs> and, and again, and, and again, for me, like that's part experience, right? It took me 12 hours to smoke the brisket that I, that we smoked last weekend. And it was delicious. I actually, first time as completely beginner's luck, it turned out really well. 
Um, normally those are actually really tough to cook, but I thought it was going to taste like a brick, but it ended up being really, really good. Um, so for me, it is, you know, partly food now because of the smoker, um, but then obviously cars, that's the thing. And then the third one is, is golf. Um, and so golf, golf is, is an expensive sport, which I'm kind of on the fence between golf and pickleball now, like in terms of where I spend my time, like I'm going to go play pickleball later today. I'm, I'm a huge pickleball fan, but golf traditionally has been, you know, something like if you buy a set of irons, like it's going to be a thousand dollars, you know? And, and so like, it's just the way that, that it is now you don't buy irons every year. I bought it like last set of irons that I got was when I finished fellowship. So it was like six years ago, but golf's expensive. We pay for a monthly country club membership. That's where, you know, um, where I go to play, play golf. And we have the least expensive one in the area. Um, uh, but it's, it's still, it's still money, you know, it's still money that, that we, we like to spend. But again, I'm experiencing that with my friends playing golf and my kids. So Grace has given up on golf, but Wesley, my, my middle kid is eight and he still likes to, to play with dad every once in a while. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that, that for me are, are you know, th- those are the three things. So it's really golf, sometimes food and then cars. Yeah, definitely, definitely cars. But, uh, but yeah, I, and, and I think that, you know, the, the lesson to take away from this is that personal finance is personal. You kind of have to figure out, like you're saying earlier, like what, what are the things that are actually meaningful to you? Like not, not what would, not what would make you happy because other people would know that you buy it, bought it. Like, that's not, that's not the goal. That's like, when you have that kind of thing going on, that, that is keeping up with the Joneses, right? That that's the, you know, I bought something so that other people could see my, my wealth or affluence or whatever. Um, and if that's the reason you're buying stuff, because you feel like you should, then that is definitely going to be consumer regret coming later. But if you buy something that, you know, you personally love, you personally enjoy, you're meeting your financial goals, you're being intentional about this, determining those and meeting those first. I think it's absolutely appropriate uh, to to splurge occasionally on on some other uh, you know not so money smart things. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. You know, um, it's interesting because if I had to add another thing in there, it would be spend money on things that are going to make your life easier. Mm. And I think that um, as physicians, sometimes we could feel a little guilty about that. You know, it's we think that we have to do it all, especially the female physicians, right? We think that we got to take care of our kids. Um, I mean, we should take care of our kids for sure, but you know, we think that we have to do everything. We're not telling you not to take uh, care of your kids. <laughs> Uh, We have to do that, you know, in in Excel in our careers. And sometimes it can be exhausting. And so finding ways to spend money in ways that that are going to give you more time. And so I think that that is key. I am curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, Jimmy, tell me what you think. Well, I I think I'm so glad that you mentioned that because honestly, that should have gone at the beginning of the show because that's one of the best ways. I I don't care what social science say about this. Like we have somebody that, that does all of our lawn and our landscaping. Um, and they, they do it. I, I, I mean, my lawn and landscape have never looked so good in my life. And like for the first 10 years that I was married, I did my lawn myself. I mowed it, you know, every, every week or two, cause it's North Carolina. And, uh, you know, it's two hours out of every Saturday when I was in residency and fellowship. And, um, and then we moved to this house, have this giant hill on the side of our, our house, but we own the lot. And so we have to mow that. And in order to mow it, you have to buy one of those like five or $6,000 huge decks because it's, it's a steep enough decline that like, if you were push mowing it, you would just like fall down the hill. <laughs> And so they, uh, you know, I was like, I'm not going to spend $5,000 on a mower. Uh, and in addition to that, I get my time back. And so we have that, uh, we have a cleaning service, the Morales family that comes and helps us, you know, clean every, every two weeks, Kristen, um, felt like that was really important for her for, you know, the, um, to have a little bit of help, uh, with, with that sort of stuff, because we hilariously, Kristen and I are, uh, funny. So like when I do laundry, it doesn't happen very often. Um, it's just an example, but when we do, when I do laundry, I don't do it very often, but I do it all. When Kristen does laundry, she like puts it through the washer, puts it through the dryer, and then it sits on the couch. <laughs> and so like, it just like stays there. Like she'll like lay it out and it just gets wrinkled. So I give her, you know, we, we always just give each other a hard time about like our, our tendencies when it comes to different stuff. But, uh, but yeah, it's really nice having someone that, you know, makes sure that, um, you know, the house is clean and the, the floors are done every couple of weeks. It's not terribly expensive, but it frees up five or six hours from, from Kristen and me having to clean the house on the weekends when we could be relaxing. Uh, cause we're both, you know, busy with work and, and cause we both do have jobs. Um, and so I, I'm a big, big believer in spending money to get your time back because what we get to use that time for is hanging out with each other and with our family and our friends, um, which builds us back up on the weekends after we've had a really busy week. And, and, and that, that investment is priceless. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, um, someone had asked me this, they were like, Leisha, when you become an attending, would you rather, you know, get a maid, a nanny? or a chef? And my answer was probably all three. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a surprise. You know, 
<laughs> I actually don't mind cooking. It's just, I don't have a ton of time and, um, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I'm not the cleanest person in the world. I don't want to think, I don't say that I'm dirty, but I, I definitely need a maid. Um, and <laughs> I don't have kids yet, but it's something that I'm planning on in the future. And, um, although I really want to be involved in their lives, I, I can totally see how there will be times and days where I'm like, okay, I need time for myself. Um, <laughs> yeah. So for me, if so yeah, for me, the, the one thing I wouldn't get is a chef because I actually enjoy the process of cooking. Like it's I, like, I, that's like an experience for me. I'm not good at it either, but like, I enjoy that process, but yeah, the, the other, the other two, I, I completely, you know, picking up what, picking up what you're putting down. I have another question for you. So as someone with kids, I'm going to ask you, cause I don't yet have kids. Um, if you are traveling out of town, let's say you're going on an international vacation. Do you think it's worth it to buy like a first class ticket? Um, I'd heard some parents talk about it and that, you know, getting some extra time, extra leg room, um, especially if you're traveling with kids, do you think it's worth it? I don't know. I'm curious. So I am hit or miss on this one. I normally don't buy first class tickets. In fact, the very first first class ticket that we ever bought, uh, I bought a couple of years ago when my sister was graduating from nursing school in Seattle. And the reason I bought it is because I was going to bring my daughter, Grace, to surprise her. And actually, she didn't know either one of us were coming. And um, But it was going to be a quick turnaround. I had to be back for call the next like day. Like, at, like So we were there for like two days. And then we turned around. And like the way that our flight was coming out to maximize our time with our family, um, it was going to be like this red eye. And then I had to drive back when I landed. So we bought first class tickets so that Grace and I could sleep on the way back, which hilariously, like, by the way, I couldn't sleep any better in first class and I couldn't business or in, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in coach. But, uh, so my, my, was she eight or nine at the time? Yeah. My eight or nine year old daughter, uh, rode first class before my wife ever did. And, uh, <laughs> so she, she, she just took her first, first class, um, trip when we went to Austin, Texas for uh, uh, a mastermind for life coach school. And, uh, and so we do it occasionally, but it's definitely not every time. Um, and if I'm traveling alone, I almost never buy first class, you know, but like when I bring family with me, yeah, there's definitely some occasions where I, I feel like that extra room is nice. Uh, it's definitely not necessary, but it's nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is one of those things where personal finance is personal, right? Cause some folks will be like, they would never buy a Porsche car, you know, but they definitely want to splurge on a first class ticket going out of the country when they're traveling with their family. And so, um, I just think it's interesting kind of how we value different things and, and all of us find joy and pleasure in, in a variety of different, um, things. So, yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and I think that's the take home here, right? Is that like, make sure that you're, you know, paying attention to what the social science, the behavioral science, psychology of money would say. And by the way, Two fantastic books on this if you want to learn more about it. So Alicia and I were talking about this before the show, actually. So The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel and then Jonathan Clements, How to Think About Money. So if this ends up on the uh, actual video, I've got, I'm have got i holding them up in front of me because I happen to have them literally right behind me when she mentioned them. Uh, but they're two great books on, on this topic. Very easy reads, really interesting reads. Highly recommend them. But at the end of the day, just be intentional. Just be intentional with your money. Make sure that you're accomplishing your goals first. But then guess what? Personal finance is personal and you get to spend it how you want in order to find the happiness. Uh, but before we close the show, we do want to encourage everybody, let us know what you think, right? Alicia and I have had a few episodes out at this point. We would love to know if you think this is great, if you think this is terrible, if you love it, you hate it. Uh, if you love it, put a five-star review on iTunes. If you hate it, just send me an email and I'll make sure to delete it. I'm just kidding. Actually, we'll take your, <laughs> we'll take your constructive criticism very, very seriously. Uh, but uh, but all things, all things uh, you know, just being kidding there. But please do leave a review. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are so that we can improve the show, make it even better than it already is. And we appreciate you tagging along every week. Yes, absolutely. So today's thought for this episode was this. Spending money to find happiness in life is part science, part art, and 100% individual to the person. So until next time, my friends, start before you're ready. Start by starting. Start now. We will see you next week. Start before you're ready. Start by starting, start now.